Today we're discussing the Church of God, Cleveland, Tennessee. There are lots of churches that use the name Church of God, so the Cleveland, Tennessee modifier is important. The first church of the movement was founded in 1886, and there was only one church until after 1902. In 1907, the name Church of God was chosen, and the church embraced Pentecostal theology. And in 1910, there were 31 churches. Today, the Church of God is among the largest Pentecostal denominations in the United States and also has a large international presence. On the major doctrines of the faith, the Church of God says on their website that the Church of God subscribes to the following five foundational Christian doctrines, the inerrancy and infallibility of the Bible, the virgin birth and complete deity of Christ, the atoning sacrifice of Christ's death for the sins of the world, the literal resurrection of the body, Christ's second coming in bodily form to earth. And also, the Church of God is evangelical. Evangelical is a term used to describe those who affirm the primary doctrines revealed in the scriptures. These doctrines include the inspiration and authority of the Word of God, the Trinity, the deity and virgin birth of Jesus Christ, salvation by faith in the atoning death of Christ, his bodily resurrection and ascension to the right hand of the Father, the ministry of the Holy Spirit, the second coming of Christ, and the spiritual unity of believers in Jesus Christ. The Church of God generally uses the term ordinances as opposed to sacraments. The first is water baptism, and the Lord's Supper and feet washing are either practiced jointly as the second ordinance or considered to be a second and third ordinance. The Church's explanatory notes say, the subject of communion and feet washing was considered, and the assembly decided that both are taught in the New Testament and may be engaged in at the same service or at different times at the option of the local churches. In order to preserve the unity of the body and to obey the sacred word, it was recommended that every member engage in these sacred services, which should be observed one or more times each year. The term sacrament is not necessarily viewed as unacceptable. The Book of Discipline says that a right of ordained ministers and bishops is to administer holy sacraments, ordinances. And Church of God Bishop Daniel Tomberlin wrote the book Pentecostal Sacraments, sold by the church's Pathway Press. In it, he writes, Sacramental worship is essential to Pentecostal spirituality. I should make a few comments about the title, Pentecostal Sacraments. First, I have chosen the word sacraments over ordinances. As you will discover in the text of the book, many Pentecostals have used the term as well. The thesis of this book is that sacramental worship is more than symbolic. Sacrament suggests the mystery and reality of a divine encounter. For baptism, the mode is immersion. The explanatory notes say, Water baptism is to plunge or dip or a burial beneath the surface of the water and a lifting out again. Baptism is not viewed as necessary for salvation, but is required to come after a conversion experience, also meaning that baptism is not for infants. The explanatory notes say, Water baptism is not a door into the church, but an act of obedience after one has been converted. Baptism also is supposed to be administered only by ministers and with a Trinitarian formula, as mentioned in the explanatory notes. That water baptism be administered by ordained ministers or bishops, and that it be in accordance with the commission given by Jesus in Matthew 28, verse 19, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. The Church's explanatory notes also recommend that if a person is satisfied with their baptism, that they not be rebaptized unless the formula was wrong. They state, We recognize immersion as the scriptural mode of water baptism. We recommend that our disciples be baptized by a minister who is baptized in the Holy Ghost. However, inasmuch as the apostles baptized before and after Pentecost, we leave this matter with the conscience of the individual, and we should not exclude them if they are satisfied with their baptism, provided they have been baptized in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Because only believers are baptized, there is no practice of confirmation. The Lord's Supper is practiced with unfermented grape juice. As with most Pentecostal denominations, most in the Church of God don't teach any view of presence of Christ in the elements, whether real presence or spiritual, but it is viewed as a memorial. Because the Church of God doesn't obligate any churches to teach one way or the other on the matter, however, there are those who preach that there is a presence of Christ in the elements of the Lord's Supper, and that there is saving grace in the sacraments. In Pentecostal Sacraments, Tom Berlin says, Although the grace of God may be encountered through other sacramental acts, marriage, child dedication, and ordination, the four sacraments that are discussed in this book are universally salvific. In other words, all believers, single or married, child or adult, lay or clergy, encounter God's salvific grace in water baptism, the Lord's Supper, foot washing, and the anointed touch. On his YouTube channel, Tom Berlin says, As we come to the altar to celebrate the Lord's Supper, we encounter the Holy Spirit of grace. 
The Holy Spirit anoints the bread and the cup, and through the Holy Spirit we experience the presence of Jesus Christ. There are no requirements in church documents on who may participate in communion, so generally a form of open communion is practiced. It is not limited to Church of God members only. The Church of God states on the beliefs page of their website that the Church of God is Protestant. The Church of God is founded upon the principles of Protestantism, although it is not a traditional follower of any specific leader of the Protestant Reformation. The denomination stands firmly for justification by faith, the priesthood of believers, the authority of the Bible, religious freedom, and the separation of church and state. It stands against abuses and extravagance of ecclesiastical ritualism and dogmatism. As Protestants, the biblical canon is the 66 books of the Old and New Testament. On non-canonical books, Daniel Black, writing in the church's Evangel magazine, says, Significant writings of the Jews between the Testaments are called the Apocrypha and the Pseudepigrapha. These writings, while not belonging to the Old Testament canon, provide important information about the history and beliefs of the Jews during the four centuries between the Testaments. As quoted earlier, the Bible is viewed as inerrant. In 1980, the Church of God made a statement on creationism, saying, Whereas secular humanism and anti-God philosophies are being taught in our public educational systems, and whereas there is a need for God's people to unite against the teaching of evolution as a scientific fact, therefore be it resolved that we give our full support to the principle that where evolution is taught in our public schools, provision be made for teaching the biblical alternative of creation. In the 2014 Religious Landscape Study by Pew Research Center, they found that among those polled in the Church of God, 18% accepted human evolution by God's design, 9% accepted human evolution that is entirely naturalistic, and 66% rejected human evolution. The Church of God affirms the human sin nature. J. Temple, writing in Evangel Magazine, says, The Bible reveals humans as sinners by nature from birth. Humanity is not good, has no righteousness, and is driven to corruption by the sin nature inherited from Adam. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. The Church of God does teach a necessary born-again or salvation experience. The Declaration of Faith states, We believe that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and that repentance is commanded of God for all, and necessary for forgiveness of sins. We believe that justification, regeneration, and the new birth are wrought by faith in the blood of Jesus Christ. The Church of God is Arminian, and thus teaches against the eternal security view, believing that salvation can be lost. Dr. French Arrington, Church of God Bishop, who has served on many denominational boards and author of Unconditional Eternal Security, Myth or Truth, writes on the Church of God's Pentecostal Evangel website, Salvation is conditional, not automatically inevitable. A person is free to get in, or as a believer, free to stay in, or to get out. The question of the operation of sanctification in the life of the believer has been controversial in the Church of God. Like other holiness denominations that accepted Pentecostal theology, the question of whether a distinct sanctification experience after salvation was necessary had to be reevaluated. Basically, all Pentecostal denominations recognized a necessary salvation experience, that is, a one-time, distinct moment of time in which a person is saved also known as the first work of grace. Additionally, all Pentecostal denominations agree that there is a distinct one-time experience of the baptism with the Holy Ghost that takes place after salvation. However, the question lies in whether those are the only two. Especially those Pentecostal denominations that never were part of the holiness movement, like Assemblies of God, say that there are only two distinct experiences and put sanctification as happening at salvation and then progressively afterward, a view called finished work. Several other holiness Pentecostal denominations said that there were three works of grace. First, salvation, then sanctification, and thirdly, spirit baptism. David Roebuck, in the article Declaration Prevents Church Division, published in the 1998 edition of Church of God History and Heritage, says the following. This anti-creedal approach to faith that characterized the heartbeat of the early Church of God also allowed for the development of diversity on some theological issues. Nowhere has this diversity been more controversial than that regarding the doctrine of sanctification. Indeed, diversity regarding sanctification led directly to the adoption of the Declaration of Faith 50 years ago. From the 1896 Shearer Schoolhouse Revival, the Church of God was clearly committed to the doctrine of entire sanctification as taught by the Holy 
Holiness movement in the United States. Along with the vast majority of Pentecostals, the church taught that the roots of sin remained after justification. Therefore, a subsequent definite work of grace was necessary to cleanse the believer of those roots. Although the Church of God did not yet subscribe to a creed, the brief fifth teaching espoused sanctification subsequent to justification. Despite early opposition to the finished work doctrine of sanctification, succeeding decades saw an influx of finished work proponents into the Church of God. When Church of God bishops, ordained ministers, met in council in 1946, the issue of sanctification dominated what historian Charles W. Quorum called one of the stormiest sessions ever experienced in the council. According to Quorum, the church became dangerously close to a break in unity and fellowship when some speakers pushed for a ruling that all ministers must sign a pledge that they would teach the second definite rather than the progressive or continuous view of sanctification. Wise heads and sincere hearts prevailed, and no such pressure was allowed. When the bishops convened again in 1948, two days had been set aside to discuss the matter of sanctification. But upon the recommendation of Paul H. Walker, the council agreed that two days were not needed. E.M. Ellis then made a motion that a committee be appointed to draw up articles of faith, paying special attention to those already approved by the Bible Training School Board of Directors. The appointed committee included proponents of both views of sanctification. James L. Slay, a respected minister and scholar, chaired the committee. Three days later, the committee brought back the present 14-item Declaration of Faith, which was approved by both the Bishops' Council and the General Assembly. The Declaration of Faith says in the Point on Sanctification the following, We believe in sanctification subsequent to the new birth through faith in the blood of Christ, through the Word, and by the Holy Ghost. A straightforward reading of the clause shows how both finished work and second work proponents could find it acceptable. Both the view of progressive sanctification or an event of sanctification fit within the general statement of sanctification subsequent to the new birth. But the statement is certainly more toward the three-event view, and the Church of God today teaches a distinct sanctification experience. As an example, the year 2000 General Assembly minutes refer to their Reach 21 outreach revealing a 66% increase of those saved, a 65% increase of those sanctified, and a 68% increase in Holy Spirit baptisms. The Church of God accepts being called both Pentecostal and Charismatic. After listing gifts of the Spirit, the Church's website says, The Holy Spirit bestows these gifts, and those who accept the validity of these gifts are called Charismatic. The Church of God, as a Pentecostal denomination, affirms a subsequent to salvation Holy Spirit baptism experience. Therefore, the Church's eighth doctrinal commitment is, Baptism with the Holy Ghost, subsequent to cleansing, the endowment of power for service. The Church affirms the so-called initial evidence doctrine, and the ninth of the Church's doctrinal commitment says that, the speaking in tongues as the Spirit gives utterance as the initial evidence of the baptism in the Holy Ghost. Other than as the initial evidence of Spirit baptism, tongues is also practiced in the Church of God for praying in tongues. Victor Morris writes in Evangel Magazine, We pray to the Father as prompted by the Spirit through the person of the Son. Now take this up a notch. When we pray in tongues, the very words we speak are prompted by the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead. The words of our prayers are the very words, logoi, of God. We are praying God's own words to the Father through the Son. How much more powerful and intimate can prayer be than this? Morris also warns about those in the denomination who may be tempted to de-emphasize or discourage tongue speaking. From the beginning of the Pentecostal movement, one of the most distinguishing features of our faith has been speaking in tongues. Tongues marks Pentecostalism as a distinct movement within Christianity. However, as Pentecostal churches have become more accepted and more mainstream, this distinctive has sometimes gone by the wayside. Some see this as a relatively unimportant development, while others view it as undermining our claim to be a spirit-directed movement. What is at stake here? Are we talking about something of great significance to our Christian walk and witness? Or is it simply a nice extra, but not all that important? I contend that tongues is extremely valuable to a Christian's spiritual life. The Church's 11th doctrinal commitment is divine healing provided for all in the atonement. Members testify of divine healing experiences and people exercising the gift of healing. J. Temple in Evangel Magazine writes, When my grandpa heard a healer was coming to a nearby church, he picked up his dad and took him for prayer. My great-grandfather was not healed that night, 
the Lord had a different plan. Instead, my grandfather was dramatically instantly saved and was healed of a physical ailment he had been struggling with. He was immediately delivered from all desire for alcohol, baptized with the Holy Spirit, and called into ministry. The church is not opposed to the use of medicine or doctors. Their explanatory notes state, we recommend that our people in testifying to divine healing refrain from using expressions, making thrusts at physicians or the use of medicine. Preach and testify to divine healing as a privilege, giving God the glory. Prophecy is viewed as an ongoing gift. Chris Suster says in Evangel Magazine, The gift of prophecy is a supernatural and spontaneous utterance in a known tongue, speaking one's own language in the power of the Holy Spirit. In the original Greek, to prophesy means to speak for another. Consequently, to prophesy is to speak for God. Like the other gifts of the Spirit, it is a divine intervention at a particular moment to meet a pressing need of God's people. The person declaring a prophecy is caught up in the Spirit and in his own language speaks a message to the church directly from the heart of God. Much like the gift of tongues and the gift of interpretation, the believer experiences a strong, almost uncontrollable urge to declare the words of God. Almost uncontrollable is appropriate because the individual does not lose control, for the spirit of the prophets are subject to the prophets, 1 Corinthians 14.32. One can and should control when and how the message of prophecy is given. We have too many members of Pentecostal churches believing the gifts are only for a chosen few. Any spirit-filled believer can be a channel through which these special graces flow to minister to God's people. We need to heed Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 14, 39, desire earnestly to prophesy. The gift of prophecy should be the most common gift operating in the church. On the manifestations of the Holy Spirit in worship, Otis Clough, writing in Evangel Magazine, says, Some of my favorite moments growing up in the Church of God have been Holy Ghost services. In these sacred meetings, I have found a sense of freedom to worship God in spirit and in truth, John 4.24. Such services are often punctuated with anointed singing, fervent prayer, dynamic preaching, and inspiring testimonies, followed by a miraculous altar service. At the altar, I have witnessed people saved through faith, Ephesians 2.8, healed and delivered, receiving miracles, and filled with the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Manifestations of the Holy Spirit are manifold when the altar service is filled with people led by the Spirit. Some churches will be more expressive of manifestations of the Spirit than others. Church of God Congregation Healing Word Ministries Church of God in Jamestown, New York says on their website, here are some of the manifestations of God's power we expect and welcome. Words of knowledge and wisdom. God speaks through a human voice to give his revealed knowledge and wisdom to the body. Prophetic words. God reveals his plans, desires, and will for individuals and the whole body through a spoken or sung message. Speaking, praying in other tongues. The scriptures teach us that God, who divided language at the Tower of Babel, restore unity to language on Pentecost. God gives gifts of tongues, languages, both earthly and heavenly, to people to speak and pray. Slain in the Spirit. Whenever people in the scriptures encounter the pure glory of God, they fall down in worship. When God's glory is present in prayer, people often are overcome and fall before him. This is not new, nor is it a mere religious form. God's power is real, and human flesh is often overcome by his power and presence. Healing, miracles, signs, and wonders. God's power is always demonstrated tangibly as evidence that his kingdom has arrived on this earth. We expect and welcome the power of God to do miraculous things in our worship gatherings and on the streets in our daily lives as we minister his power to others. In the church's website page for Doctrine and Polity Papers, the paper on spiritual gifts, written by Gerald Daff of the Doctrine and Polity Committee, does contain instruction on orderliness of spiritual gifts. He says, But everything should be done in a fitting and orderly way, 1 Corinthians 14.40. This verse provides the foundational principle for the orderly operation of all spiritual gifts. Its application must, of necessity, be evident in both small group meetings and corporate church services. There is no setting in which chaos, unsubstantiated claims, or questionable integrity are to be present. Anyone who claims the Holy Spirit commandeered their body does not understand that he works through us as we are in submission to his will and timing. Bizarre actions and claims frequently are the result of well-intentioned individuals who definitely get in the flesh or have good but unsubstantiated intentions for others. 1 Corinthians 14 verses 27 through 33 provides very specific instructions concerning speaking in tongues, interpretation of tongues, and prophecies. These include the order, number of speakers, and submitting to others when presenting their giftedness. Verse 33 reminds us that God himself is a God of order and peace. Another article linked in Doctrine and Polity Papers on Spirit-Filled Worship says, 
Worship in the spirit produces liberty for every kind of spiritual manifestation. However, liberty always has a purpose and a goal. The spirit gives liberty so that the church may minister to one another and reach out to unbelievers. Therefore, the liberty of the spirit has certain boundaries. Freedom does not stand in opposition to order and decorum. Churches have their own preferences and habits regarding the order of service, but they do practice a certain order, and that order ensures that liberty does not degenerate into chaos. The members of the body must submit to the head, which is Christ, and Christ has put into place the pastors and leaders who oversee the worship. On eschatology, the Church of God's Declaration of Faith says that they believe in the premillennial second coming of Jesus, first, to resurrect the righteous dead and to catch away the living saints to him in the air, second, to reign on the earth a thousand years, and also, in the bodily resurrection, eternal life for the righteous and eternal punishment for the wicked. In 1996, the Church of God made a statement on the sanctity of marriage between man and woman. The resolution of the statement says, Be it therefore resolved that we, the 66th General Assembly of the Church of God, do reaffirm our commitment to the Word of God and its ever-present defense of marriage as a holy and sacred union between one man and one woman, and be it further resolved that we do hereby state our opposition to the rising trend toward legitimizing homosexual unions, and be it finally resolved that we encourage our members to help preserve marriage as a sacred union between man and woman by living lives that model commitment to the Word of God, exemplify devotion to moral purity, and celebrate family responsibility. The statement also said, The Church of God has continued to affirm this basic belief through a practical commitment regarding moral purity, which condemns homosexuality as a fleshly behavior and sinful practice. The Book of Discipline adds, The credentials of a minister must be revoked when found guilty of a homosexual offense, and he or she must be disfellowshipped from the church. He or she is never to be reinstated to the ministry. On divorce and remarriage, the church's practical commitment on the sanctity of marriage says, Because of the divine character of marriage, it is a lifelong commitment with the only clear biblical allowance for divorce being fornication. Matthew 5, 32, 19, verse 9. Sexual involvement, either before marriage or with someone other than the marriage partner, is strictly forbidden in Scripture. Exodus 20, 14, 1 Corinthians 6, 15 through 18. Understanding the sanctity of marriage, partners should strive to maintain a happy, harmonious, and holy relationship. Should divorce occur, the church should be quick to provide love, understanding, and counsel to those involved. The remarriage of divorced persons should be undertaken only after a thorough understanding of and submission to the scriptural instructions concerning this issue. In 1976, the Church of God made the following statement on abortion. Whereas life originated in the creative work of Almighty God, and whereas man himself is created in the image and likeness of God, and whereas God assigns special value to human life, and whereas divine law forbids the indiscriminate taking of human life, exacting heavy penalties of those who violate this commandment, and whereas contemporary society demonstrates a low esteem for the sacredness of life, and whereas abortion on demand now receives serious consideration as a means of birth control and population control, and whereas abortion is a vicious attack on the weakest and most helpless form of human life, and whereas the unborn are unable to speak in their own defense, and whereas intense pressure is being brought upon state and national legislative bodies to liberalize abortion laws, and whereas it is the duty of the church to raise an authoritative moral voice concerning this vital issue, therefore be it resolved that we, the General Assembly of the Church of God, reaffirm our historic commitment to the sacredness of human life, and be it further resolved that we stand opposed to the use of abortion as a means of birth or population control, and be it further resolved that we urge our entire constituency to actively oppose any liberalization of abortion laws by state legislatures and by the Congress of the United States, and be it further resolved that no individual should ever consider abortion as an option except in the gravest circumstances after medical and religious consultation of the most serious nature. Church of God congregations are low church as compared to the liturgical experience that would be found at most Catholic churches or in a traditional mainline Presbyterian service, for example. However, due to their history of teaching members to give their best to God, members will in most cases still dress up for church services, and there is an emphasis on modesty. One of the church's practical commitments says, Our life, character, and self-image are reflected by our apparel and mode of dress. The admonition of scripture, Be not conformed to this world, reminds us that our manner of dress must be modest and decent. Romans 12.2, 1 Thessalonians 5.22 and 23. It is not displeasing to God for us to dress well and be well-groomed. However, above all, we must seek spiritual beauty, which does not come from outward adornment with jewelry, expensive clothes or cosmetics, but from good works, chaste conversation, and a meek and quiet spirit. 
The Church of God's Practical Commitment Statement on Addiction and Enslavement says the following in part, A Christian must totally abstain from all alcoholic beverages and other habit-forming and mood-altering chemical substances and refrain from the use of tobacco in any form, marijuana, and all other addictive substances, and further must refrain from any activity, such as gambling or gluttony, which defiles the body as the temple of God or which dominates and enslaves the spirit that has been made free in Christ. Tithing is taught and practiced in the Church of God. As the minutes of the year 2000 General Assembly state, Why do we talk about tithes and finances? There is one answer. A righteous church is a kingdom church. A kingdom church is a tithing church. All members and ministers of the Church of God shall pay tithes into the church where they are members. The church also states, If a member does not have enough interest in the church to support it with his tithes, he should have respect enough for the church to keep quiet in business meetings. The denomination states of the polity of the church, The Church of God Cleveland, Tennessee, USA has a centralized, by legal definition hierarchical, form of church government. The International General Assembly, the highest authority of the Church of God, governs the ownership of all church property, both real and personal. All property is held in trust for members composing said International General Assembly. Additionally, it is stated, the right of any local church as a whole to withdraw from the International General Assembly is not recognized and does not exist. But those members who prove disloyal to the government and teachings as promulgated from time to time by the International General Assembly or who are otherwise disorderly are to be dealt with as individuals. Ministers in the Church of God are not allowed to start independent congregations outside of the church structure. The Book of Discipline states, The International General Assembly does not recognize or approve the practice of our ministers setting up independent congregations who do not subscribe to the doctrines, faith, practices, teachings, and government of the Church of God. Be it further resolved that we do not approve our ministers pastoring or otherwise assisting such independent congregations, and declare that ministers who persist in doing so are out of harmony with our stated policy of centralized government, and appropriate action should be initiated by proper authorities against offending ministers. There are three levels of ministers in the Church of God. First is exhorter, secondly ordained minister, and third is bishop. The Church of God requires its ministers to have the baptism of the Holy Ghost. They state, All applicants for the ministry, including ordained bishops, ordained ministers, exhorters, ministers of music, and ministers of Christian education, must have the baptism in the Holy Ghost. All three levels may preach, serve as pastors of churches, or be evangelists. The Book of Discipline states, The Church of God has chosen such terms as exhorter, novitiate, ordained minister, intermediate level, and ordained bishop, the highest level of credentialed minister. These terms do not deal with the essential meaning of ordination. That is, they do not arise out of biblical language and are not the products of biblical exegesis. They are the products of a tradition in church polity, but they are not biblical terms. Except in cases of emergency, exhorters are not to baptize converts or receive new members into the church. Ordained ministers may do so, and they may plant new churches and sit in the General Assembly, but only bishops may vote. Additionally, the church recognizes a role of deacon. The church states about divorced ministers, No applicant whose former spouse is living, or whose spouse's former spouse is living, shall be considered eligible for ministerial credentials except in cases where the divorce occurred because of the infidelity of the former spouse. See Matthew 19 verse 9. On women in ministry, the church's book of discipline states, female ministers are to use the same ministerial titles as male ministers, with all the requirements, duties, responsibilities, and ministry opportunities of male ministers who hold either the first or second level of ministerial credentials, as presently set forth in this book of minutes of the International General Assembly. It is understood that female ministers are not eligible for ordination as bishop. The Church of God is part of the Wesleyan Holiness Connection, National Association of Evangelicals, Pentecostal Charismatic Churches of North America and Pentecostal World Fellowship. The Church of God reports 7 million members in 36,000 churches worldwide. 6,448 congregations are in the United States or Canada. Of those churches, 1,803 are majority non-white. 925 are Hispanic churches and 654 congregations with members primarily of African descent. Dozens of denominations are discussed and explained in detail here on the Ready to Harvest channel. Please like this video if you found it useful. Subscribe and ring the bell to be notified of our new releases.